All right, so I guess we are live. So welcome everyone for that last uh, keynote lecture of the main conference. And I am absolutely uh, delighted to uh, get to introduce Dr. Lucina Udin to deliver that, that last lecture. So uh, Dr. Udin is a professor in psychiatry at the University of California, Los Angeles. And she's also the co-director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience Analysis Core at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Behavior. So Dr. Udin is uh, working a lot with functional MRI data and diffusion MRI data to try to characterize the organization of large-scale uh, brain networks. She's also studying how those networks relate to cognitive and executive function. And uh, recently, our main focus of research is to understand how brain dynamics uh, underlie cognitive inflexibility in autism. So not only looking at kind of normal brain function, but also at uh, uh, abnormal, outlier types of, of behavior. So just a little bit of background for those who are not familiar with uh, Dr. Udin's work. Uh, she's a psychologist. She received her PhD from the psychology department of UCLA uh, in 2006. She's been a postdoctoral fellow at the Child Study Center of uh, New York University. She's been a faculty at uh, the Stanford School of Medicine in Psychiatry for several years, and she only moved this year to her new home in UCLA, coming back to the roots because that's where she did her PhD. So I hope you're having a great time in your new home, uh, Lucina. Um, so Lucina is a, a, a inspiring figure and already a, a leader of the neuroimaging community. She's been the, the program chair of uh, Human Brain Mapping. She's been the Young Investigator Award recipient of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping in 27. She is a CIFAS really global scholar in the Brain, Mind and Consciousness program uh, for 2018. And um, Personally, I, I would like to say she's, she's a, a, a sort of yeah inspiring figure, mentor for the young generation, and she's also pushed as a leader in the committee a lot of uh, kind of activism, get, getting us to be more sustainable, diverse, and and, and good people overall. So um, the, the best way to close up, <laughs> main Lucina, take it away. Okay. Um, first, can you see my screen? <laughs> we can see your screen. So everything is good and you can hear me? Very well. Okay, great. Thank you, Pierre, so much for this wonderful introduction and the opportunity to present to this um, this great crowd. Uh, I thought it was funny that I was asked to present in um, a, a meeting about neuroscience and AI. So I scrambled to do some reading on AI and figure out what I could possibly say. And then I realized, okay, I just have to give my usual talk because I can't come up with a talk on AI because that's not what I work on. But what I can tell you is that I work uh, on flexible behaviors and how the brain implements these kind of flexibility. And from, from the rest of, of these uh, presentations today, I've learned a lot about how we think about um, intelligence and how uh, flexibility is a, a very big part of that. Um, in particular, I'm intrigued by some of these conditions uh, like autism, for example, where you see this symptom of insistence on sameness or lack of flexibility, where uh, sometimes kids with the disorder might want to wear a particular type of sock or uh, eat a particular food and uh, have a very inflexible way of, of behaving in the world. Um, so usually I start with these kinds of slides uh, in the first few minutes of my talk just to talk about how important flexibility is for you know, uh, social adaptation and economic uh, outcomes and employment. But I think we've all seen um, due to COVID how much we have to change all our activities and behaviors on a dime. So we know what it's like to be flexible because we're giving talks uh, on Zoom instead of giving them in person. Um, so I don't really have to explain to you what flexibility is and how it, uh, it you know, it's, it's just critical for, for everyday life. Um, but you know, when, when thinking about today's topic, um, you know, what's what's so difficult about making artificial intelligence flexible? I just uh, grabbed a quote from a recent technology review article that talks about how um, AI has grown remarkably human-like, even superhuman, achieving specific tasks. It still it, it can do all these specific tasks, but still doesn't capture the flexibility of the human brain. 
Um, we can learn skills in one context, apply them to another, but by contrast, these, um, these algorithms um, can beat the world's best players, but can't extend that strategy beyond the board. So uh, deep learning algorithms, in other words, are masters at picking up patterns, but cannot understand and adapt to a changing world, uh, which is what we tend to do um, as humans uh, all the time, which is what we're doing right now. So uh, what our lab is uh, overall interested in is understanding how brain networks, um, you know, in how uh, they develop from childhood through adolescence into adulthood, and how that underlies cognitive development, particularly in the executive function domain under which uh, their umbrella sort of under which flexibility falls. And we also take an interest in looking at atypical development of these systems in neurodevelopmental conditions like autism, for example, attention deficits, um, and other, other uh, early life disorders. And so we tend to study um, typical adults, uh, you know, um, at the same time as typical development using comparisons of children and adults or lifespan approaches and clinical populations with multimodal neuroimaging, uh, non-invasively um, studying the brain using either resting or task fMRI or diffusion imaging or connectivity modeling approaches to understand the integrity and the development of these large scale brain networks that we think underlie flexible behaviors. And uh, some of the foundations that I want to always start with are, um, you know, in this field of network neuroscience that I find myself in, um, it's interesting to note that even before modern neuroimaging techniques, there was a lot of uh, talk about, um, you know, how one brain region doesn't subserve just one function. So there's this sort of plurality and there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between one particular cognition, uh, you know, one particular aspect of cognition and one brain region. Um, so there's a nice paper from Meslam back in 1990, who just, you know, observing neuropsychological patients and lesions uh, commented that cognition is subserved by interconnected neural networks and complex behavior is mapped at the level of multifocal neural systems rather than specific anatomical sites. Uh, and there's nice work from Randy McIntosh. Here's one uh, paper where he talks about the importance of neural context. That is the functional relevance of a brain area depends on the status of other connected areas. So, you know, you can't really understand the function of these four gray nodes in the network without taking into consideration the context in which that network is embedded, um, which might be different like in panel A compared to uh, at a different time point panel B. Um, so understanding sort of the context of a, a system within a larger network is, is critical in this vein. And finally, the, uh, here's a quote from a paper by Luis Pessoa, where he writes that a network needs to be understood in terms of the interactions between multiple brain regions as they unfold temporally. So these are all the, the things we have to keep in the background as we're, as we're doing all of our studies, um, that we're working with dynamic processes and um, there's limitations to what all our different imaging methods can tell us, but uh, we have to see if we can the best we can do with the methods that we have to reveal these underlying dynamics. And uh, so ever since Bharat Biswal's paper in 1995, showing that you can find coherent uh, fluctuations in the resting state in functional magnetic resonance imaging, we've, you know, and others have taken a lot of advantage of this um, in order to to map the integrity and extent of large scale brain networks. And the big sort of uh, discovery here was that um, when you're just sitting lying in the scan or not doing anything at all, the brain is sort of cycling through these patterns that resemble memory networks or attention networks or um, uh, you know, networks that we would use in other high level cognitive processes. They're at a very low frequency. They're highly, the activity in these networks is correlated and you can find this um, you know, across brains and uh, relatively stable um, so we, you know, we've been taking advantage of this particular aspect of brain dynamics to uh, to look at a lot of um, relationships between these underlying uh, processes and how we behave in the world. Um, so over this last pandemic year and a half, I've had the chance to look back on all the literature on flexible behaviors in humans. Um, so it's a couple of reviews here for those who like reviews. And it struck me that we just, um, we don't have sort of one definition of, of what is flexibility, but we, we have operationalized it in, in many different ways. Um, and in, in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience, we tend to talk about cognitive flexibility, but in animal work, we, we might use the phrase behavioral flexibility because oftentimes we can't uh, get any self-report out of the animals. So we might um, see how good are they at 
uh, switching their stimulus outcome mappings, for example, that's one measure of behavioral flexibility in an animal. Whereas in humans, we can, we can uh, directly probe flexible behaviors by asking individuals to categorize cards according to different features and, and seeing how well they do. Um, and then when we want to ask kids how to be flexible uh, or, or test if kids can be flexible, we tend to have uh, even cuter sort of stimuli and um, kinds of tasks where we, we switch, um, you know, whether they're supposed to name the color or the direction the fish is pointing. So we've, we've operationalized what flexibility is in many different ways and, and studied them across different conditions. Um, and, and tried to find what brain systems are, are largely sort of responsible for this kind of flexible behavior, landing on lateral frontal parietal, uh, mid cingulate insular, and also front uh, orbital frontal, uh, frontal um, and, and uh, basal ganglia systems is sort of important in all of these types of tasks. But um, what's really intriguing is that you'll see flexibility deficits everywhere you look in early life neurodevelopmental disorders in um, things that have sort of midlife onset and, and later life dementias. You see things like cognitive rigidity, um, persistent thoughts, repetitive negative thinking, repetitive behaviors. All of these are, are some aspect of inflexibility. So there's you know, ways in which flexibility breaks down. Um, what we did uh, in the MRI recently was try to pick a task that we know kids can do, that we know comes actually from the developmental literature. Um, and uh, uh, sort of adapted to the scanner environment. So this is called the flexible item selection task. And you're just asking participants, children in this case, in the, uh, nine to 12 year old age range, asking them to pick two things that go together. So they might pick you know, the second and the fourth card because they're both blue. And then you ask them, well, pick another set of two things that go together. And they might pick the third and the fourth panel because they're both rabbits. And then you might say, well, go ahead and pick another uh, two cards that go together. And they might pick the first and the fourth because they correspond to one object each. Um, and so in the scanner, we could do an easy thing where we say, just cut, you know, hit the buttons that are highlighted so we can sort of make them do this task uh, without actually thinking about it. And it turns out um, when you do this in adults, so we did want to make it difficult enough that adults and children and uh, you know, different populations could do the task in the scanner spent a bunch of time, uh, Dina Dejani in the lab spent a bunch of time, you know, tweaking the test to get it to work in this way um, and checking that the behavioral responses inside and outside of the scanner were, were correlated and the, uh, that people basically get more efficient at a flexible item selection task like this over time. Um, and as one might expect, there's really robust activation in frontoparietal systems and um, cerebellum and basal ganglia when you look at this flexibility minus control contrast. Um, cingulate uh, cortex and uh, insula as well, strong activations when, when people are engaged in a task of this, this nature. Now, what's interesting is that there's nothing really unique about those systems, right? So if you do neurosynth uh, meta-analysis of tasks that, uh, for example, look at shifting or, or working or uh, shifting or sets, set uh, shifting kinds of tasks or, or task switching, they always activate these, these same regions. And if you look at updating or working memory meta-analyses, overlap again with the same frontal parietal and cingulate insular regions. Inhibition um, you know, very strongly activates these same brain regions. So what's different about um, what's going on in this task is we used a, a method called group iterative multiple uh, model estimation, which is a, a structural equation uh, modeling framework to look at relationships between different regions of interest in different task contexts. So it's an effective connectivity uh, model. And um, the main finding from this study in adults was that the inferior frontal junction seems to be more important in this type of flexible item selection. It's sort of uh, when you account for activity in that region that um, you know, explains all the other activation in the rest of these uh, network nodes. And importantly, in this study, there was a lot of individual variability in the individual paths or the individual connections between brain regions supporting this flexible item selection. So um, in fact, in this, in this whole group, there are a lot of different ways of getting at a correct answer in these tasks, in these types of tasks. And there's a lot of, it turns out the brain is very flexible in terms of uh, how different individuals actually complete this. So um, this is just to say that if you were designing a machine to be flexible, it wouldn't be so easy as just let's do it the way the human brain does it, because the human brain does this kind of thing in many different ways. Um, in fact, uh, you couldn't even find subgroups of individuals who do the task the same way because there were so many different individual level connections um, supporting this uh, su supporting effective 
um, completion of this test. So, you know, we originally we designed this so that we could then take it to the younger children and clinical populations. Um, but another sort of branch of our of our lab looks at development of brain networks, you know, using lifespan approaches and uh, comparing children to adults. And we look at things like how brain signal variability changes across the lifespan in, in ways that we think are related to flexibility. We look at how structural and functional and effective changes um, strengthen from childhood into adulthood, particularly in certain network nodes we think are very important for flexibility in the frontal lobes. And we look at how um, certain interactions between networks increase or decrease in their strength over time or over age. Um, you know, between the ages of six and 85. So this is sort of other work uh, on development of flexibility that, that we do. Um, but for this particular task-related study, um, Lauren Kupis is working on this. Uh, kids do activate some of the same regions as, as adults, um, as one might expect, maybe to a little bit of a weaker extent. So this was one of the projects that was cut short due to the pandemic. So we weren't able to collect as much data as we'd like from the children with autism who we, um, we, we recruited, but uh, she's currently working on this data set and we'll see what we can do. Um, but what I want to leave you with here is that cognitive flexibility involves the coordination among multiple brain regions that support executive function. And in fact, there can be a lot of individual differences in the way that uh, people take on a, a task of flexible um, cognition. Um, so that's important to remember. And uh, adults and children broadly engage lateral frontal parietal and mid singular insular networks during this type of flexible item selection. And in, in this context, tax, task modulated connectivity of the inferior frontal ejection in particular seems to be really important for this type of flexible behavior. So you'll have to stay tuned for this shortened study on children with autism, um, which we're currently wrapping up. So uh, it's a little bit easier in some ways to, to study typical adults. Um, so sometimes we just go over and, and take data from uh, large projects like the Human Connectome Project and do more population neuroscience type of studies. But if we wanna look at underlying brain dynamics that um, can be related to these individual differences in flexibility, uh, one, one approach we've taken is to, first of all, quantify brain dynamics using resting state fMRI. Um, and that's uh, many ways to do this, but one way is just to use a sliding window approach. So you can, uh, instead of averaging across a 10 minute scan, you can average in shorter chunks of 60 seconds or 45 seconds and compute a whole brain functional connectivity matrix that gives you a, a snapshot of what the brain is doing in that window. Um, and you can use things like clustering to say, okay, it looks like we're going between these two or three different uh, states of functional connectivity. And you can go ahead and compute things like how frequently, uh, what's the frequency of occurrence of one particular brain state? Um, how long does that state persist once it occurs? And how many state transitions are there? Are there you know, switches between states uh, you know, very often? Um, so Jason Nomi in the lab a few years back uh, took this approach to look at how resting state underlying dynamics might be related to individual differences in flexible cognition. So he took this, um, Human Connectome Project Resting State fMRI data from a couple hundred subjects. What's really nice is that they have an hour for each subject, so you can do split half and reliabilities and replications and all, all sorts of things. A lot of data um, there, and as well, a lot of neuropsychological uh, tests and um, you know cognition that's tested outside of the scanner. And what he found was that um, the brain in these individuals seems to toggle through uh, these states that I've number from least frequently occurring to most frequently occurring. Um, and uh, most of the time we're in this sort of loosely connected state where brain regions are sort of uh, weakly connected with each other. And a, a small fraction of the time we're in state five where there's strong um, crosstalk between different brain regions. And it turns out that those individuals who do better on the working memory and cognitive flexibility outside of the scanner seem to spend more time in those loosely connected states that are more frequently occurring and less time in those, uh, those states where there, there's strong sort of overall brain connectivity. So this suggests that um, one way of supporting greater cognitive flexibility is, is to you know, just have, happen to have a brain that uh, has the propensity to occupy these more frequently occurring loose connectivity states. These are characterized by attenuated correlations across the brain and greater functional connectivity variability. Um, so this is just showing one way in which um, you know dynamic functional connectivity approaches can reveal 
relationships between brain dynamics and flexible cognition. So, um, you know, at the whole brain level, this sort of loose pattern seems to be uh, correlated at least with, with greater cognitive flexibility. Again, suggesting that there's no sort of one way in which the brain does flexible uh, stuff. It's, there's a lot of different ways in which flexibility is supported. Um, so it might not be so easy to recreate a flexible intelligence system, at least in the same way that our brains do it. Um, and what's more, of course, the brain isn't just this um, monolith uh, thing with different with uh, structures that all do the same thing. We do have some degree of functional specialization. Uh, so over the years, my colleagues and I have been working on this model of, of neurocognitive network dynamics that we think um, does a nice job of accounting for all different kinds of network related phenomena in the brain. In particular, you often see talk of the default network or the medial front, frontal parietal system in, in yellow here. The key nodes in the medial prefrontal and posterior cingulate cortex, and there's talk of, you know, internally directed and self and uh, self related and social cognitive processes that seem to activate that network. And on the other hand, there's there's these sort of well known frontal parietal executive networks involving lateral prefrontal and parietal cortices that seem to be more of the working memory executive function, the externally directed goal oriented task networks. Um, and then uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, you get this mid cingulo insular or salience network. Um, with key nodes in the anterior insula and anterior cingulate that, um, seem, that we've seen from a lot of work using Granger causal modeling and other approaches that seems to come online a little bit earlier and seems to um, have the ability to influence switching between the other two networks uh, on uh, the executive and the default. So um, there seems to be some kind of like central role for the insula in, in all of this switching, which I'll, I'll touch on as we go further along, it happens to be my favorite brain region as anyone who knows me will tell you. Um, so if you wanna think about how these, these particular systems, which are so ubiquitous in cognitive neuroscience, how they change across the lifespan in ways that might be related to flexibility. It's another project that my uh, grad student, Lauren Coop has recently worked on, taking a, a nice sample of 601 subjects available from the NKI Rockland uh, sample between the ages of six and 85, so a nice lifespan sample here. And there's also these um, uh, trail making uh, Dallas Kaplan sort of executive function tests when you're switching between connecting uh, numbers sequentially and all, uh, letters of the alphabet. And I'm told it's a hard task, but um, in any case, it's supposed to be a, a, a task of, of flexibility um, that, that's been done again outside of the scanner. And here, um, instead of using sliding window, we're just going with a, a co-activation pattern analysis to look at uh, uh, dynamics. And we're just, instead of uh, you know, worrying about the arbitrary window length here, we're doing something that looks more at how brain regions come online um, using a, a time point by time point approach that still lets us calculate a lot, a lot of the same dynamic metrics. <clears throat> and here, um, she's focused on nodes in the you know, executive or lateral frontal parietal and uh, default or medial frontal parietal networks. And what's interesting is that just this co-activation pattern where all of those nodes are sort of coming online at once, that co-activation pattern itself shows a trajectory across the lifespan that um, is, is you know, this inverted U that you see everywhere. Um, but basically that, that co-activation pattern sort of peaks in middle midlife and then uh, wanes again in late life. And uh, we did this project in collaboration with Nathan Sprang up there at McGill. And so this fit nicely also with his default executive coupling hypothesis of aging. So that was exciting. Um, but moreover, the relationship between these brain dynamics and the flexibility as, as uh, indexed by that trail, the TMT, the switching task, that relationship is really complicated. It turns out where you are along the lifespan, um, there's a different relationship between the dynamics and uh, for example, the number of transitions between brain states. So when there's a high number of transitions between brain states, that's actually helpful for the trail making performance or the, the TMT performance. So you're better at being more flexible if there's more transitions between brain states, but only if you're in the young age range or the older end of life there. In midlife, that relationship switches where um, you know, having fewer transitions between brain states supports the better flexibility. So the, uh, the brain is not doing the same thing all the time, right? We, we're young, we learn, we basically everything falls off um, towards late life um, in terms of performance on many of these things. And it turns out the way that the brain dynamics are supporting these behaviors across the lifespan um, differs. So 
frequency of co-activation patterns involving these lateral frontal parietal executive systems and medial frontal parietal default systems changes across the lifespan. And transitions between brain states support cognitive flexibility in different ways at different stages of the lifespan. So it's not a sort of uh, uniform uh, pattern. And because we, we always you know, focus on the insula, I wanna talk a little bit about why we think that's such an important part of all of these dynamics. And, um, and not only in terms of mediating switches between the other networks, but it's sort of inherent function. And um, so the insula, you know, hidden there uh, in the lateral uh, sulcus is always brought up in studies of emotion, empathy, or pain. So it's, it's clearly involved in all these affective processes. But uh, also you see um, subjective awareness, introception, and somatosensory processes are, you know, are always evoking uh, insular activation. And at the same time, high level uh, processes like conflict switching attention and inhibition um, executive function, basically, all of that also seems to activate the insula. So it, it, we can't uh, get rid of the insula. It's always, it's always there in, in so many of the different domains that people study. Um, there's been a lot of work now looking at parcellation. I'm not going to say how many parcels there are because that's a different question. That's a, a clustering problem, not an insula problem. But, you know, there's a few studies that have shown at least three subdivisions within the insula. Um, there's evidence for a dorsal anterior a ventral anterior and a posterior subdivision, you know, within this larger structure. And these are studies uh, using um, uh, clustering voxels in the insula based on their whole brain patterns of resting state, functional and connectivity. Um, so there's a few, a bunch of studies out there now, but I'd say there's anywhere between like two and 20 some subdivisions if you, uh, depending on how you look. But in this um, set of studies, uh, here at the top from Luke Chang, um, he did a, a meta-analysis here and asked the question, whenever you see the, the ventral anterior insula subdivision active in a study, what are the terms that tend to show up in those papers? And on the left, you see it's usually the anxiety, emotion, face, a more of affective type of, of a process seems to be what activates the ventral anterior insula. And on the right is a study um, we did a, a while back. This one was with Luis Pessoa and Michael Anderson. Um, but basically asking the question, using meta-analytic connectivity modeling across studies, if the ventral anterior insula is active, what other brain regions are active? And we, again, saw some limbic um, structures there suggesting co-activity between ventral anterior and uh, um, limbic regions. And if you look at the dorsal anterior, it seems to have a different profile. The dorsal anterior insula is activated in studies that use the terms in blue, so error processing, inhibition, switching, the executive stuff I've been talking about. And when you see dorsal anterior insula activity in a task fMRI study, you often see uh, as well frontal parietal activity as there on the right. Um, and on the bottom, we're just showing uh, meta-analysis of po posterior insula, which seems to be more involved in the studies that investigate pain, somatosensory processes, et cetera. And when you see posterior insula active, you often also see sensory motor cortices, uh, as you can see on the right in this meta-analytic connectivity modeling. Um, so all of these you know, things suggest there may be some subdivisional specificity there, even though all the insula subdivisions are active across all of these cognitive domains. So there is some commonality and some um, you know, uh, specificity. So Jason Nomi in the lab kind of took this dynamic approach to look at the different subdivisions and see how they talk to the rest of the brain, again, using resting state fMRI and a sliding window approach. Um, and the long story short here is that there's some connectivity states like state three or state one, for example, in which the insula subdivisions seem to talk to other brain regions, um, you know, without too much discrepancy between the different subdivisions. But in some unique states like state five, the connectivity profile suggests divergence of connectivity patterns, which means the different subdivisions are talking to different brain regions, a minority, a fraction of the time. And this is, um, what's interesting though, is that the dorsal anterior insula subdivision is the one that's the most different between connectivity states. So it's the one that between <clears throat> different fun functional connectivity profiles, it talks to different brain regions the most. So it's the most variable in its profile. Um, I, the reason I find that interesting is because it's always the dorsal anterior subdivision in our studies of causal modeling that seems to be the one that affects the switches between the default mode and central executive. And so um, this you know, functional flexibility seems to be a property of the dorsal anterior subdivision in particular.
Um, so Will Snyder was an undergrad in the lab who was able to um, do a lifespan study of the, the sort of insula and salience network across the lifespan using that same data set of 600 participants. There's a lot of things going on in this particular paper um, that just came out last year or this year. But I wanted to just draw attention to one interesting trend, which is that um, this uh, salience, this is a state when the insula is sort of less or loosely connected with the rest of the brain here. And that particular state seems to be present more in early life and then uh, is there less often in, in the midlife range. And then you see that state again, the sort of isolated salience network state. You see it again, late life again. So here you've got a, another U shape. So just a lot of interesting ways that these dynamics change across the lifespan that we're only beginning to understand, but um, we think are, are likely related to a lot of the new changes we see both in, in typical and, and pathological aging. Um, and there's some uniqueness about structural connectivity of these different subdivisions, which I won't spend any time on today, but um, it does seem that the dorsal anterior insula has some unique connections with frontal um, and uh, uh, some cortical structures that might underlie this um, uh, important role that I, uh, I've been talking about. So um, it seems the insular cortex in adults can be parcelated into a dorsal anterior, a ventral anterior, and a posterior subdivision. With the dorsal anterior a little bit more involved in cognitive control types of processes, um, the ventral anterior mo more involved in emotion, uh, and the posterior sort of more involved in the sensation. And the, the dynamics of this uh, singular insular or salience network show really complex maturational changes across the lifespan that we're just kind of starting to unpack. The dorsal anterior insula, that sort of unique subdivision I mentioned, exhibits the most variable functional connections with the rest of the brain, uh, and also unique structural connections we think that might enable the functional flexibility of this region. And the reason I, I focus so much on pointing out brain structures that are, are really uh, causal outflow hubs or really you know, more flexible than other brain structures is that um, I don't think we can ever just treat all brain regions the same, like they do have important different functional and structural properties. And so that any theory or any like instantiation of, of flexibility that doesn't into, take into account these inherent differences in brain structural and functional features is gonna be missing something, I think. So I'm one of those people who like, doesn't really love blind application of graph theory because I think that often ignores the special roles that certain brain regions or nodes can have um, if you, you know, treat all nodes the same. So that's just a side note. But um, to really uh, get at the temporal specificity of a lot of these uh, insular findings, um, requires getting better resolution than we can get with fMRI. So a lot of work has now looked at used intracranial recordings to, you know, to map directly from the, the cortex as patients are being monitored for epilepsy. So these are some studies from other groups who have started to, you know, to look at, uh, uh, look at these types of data and conduct network analyses of the type I've been describing with the, uh, from fMRI. So I'm um, excited to be part of an ongoing collaboration with uh, folks at the uh, at Western University um, up there in Canada as well. And I know they have a neurosurgical unit that often places electrodes in uh, depth ele electrodes along the insula. So sometimes uh, going into the the uh, anterior, the middle, and the posterior insula in the same patient. Um, and so that's also a, a project that's a little bit on on hold because of the pandemic, but hopefully starting up again very soon. But with this type of millisecond resolution, you can really get at these questions of, uh, you know, which brain regions are sort of activated first or, or most involved in, in these different kinds of flexibility tasks and how do they, you know, affect other regions in other networks that are also important for flexibility. So I'm happy to, um, you know, say that we're moving along with this uh, soon. Um, and finally, the, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, we do focus a lot on neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and trying to understand how to, you know, improve flexibility in, in some of these conditions to, you know, receive the sort of, or to, to reveal kind of more optimal levels. Um, and that what I think is interesting in autism in particular is that you, you see some statistics that are surprisingly grim in terms of independent living, for example, um, compared with other, uh, other disorders of early life. Very few individuals diagnosed with autism end up, uh, you know, being able to basically live on their own. 
Uh, and the same thing goes for employment. So there's a high level, you know, 80% unemployment for young adults with autism. That's actually much higher unemployment than some of these other disabilities. And I think there's a lot of focus on social communication deficits in autism. It's a big area of research and a big area of, of intervention. But um, there's also the other side of, of the deficits which fall under executive functions broadly and flexibility more specifically. And I think if you, you think about what, it, what daily living requires, um, you know, it's, it's taking the bus when the train doesn't show up and it's, um, you know, uh, working with new colleagues and it's, um, you know, being flexible in terms of the way that you uh, interact with the world. And so I think these deficits are really a lot of what contribute to some of these outcomes. Um, and the good news is, I suppose, that there are training uh, intervention behavioral therapies, specifically targeting flexibility that seem to be um, evidence-based. And some of these um, can really do, you know, a good job of, of moving children along into a point where they can be more flexible. Um, so the question is, of course, like when to do these trainings for optimal effect and uh, whether or not they'll actually help because they're obviously going to be time and labor intensive. And it turns out like, like you might ex have expected, there's a lot of heterogeneity in disorders like autism where not every kid is going to have the same profile of deficits. And in fact, if you use things like a latent profile analysis across indicators of executive function in a mixed group of children, including autism, ADHD, and comorbid autism and ADHD, um, it turns out there's three, in this couple of studies, uh, there's three different executive function classes that you can, you can derive from this large sample. Um, and if you look at the average executive function class, it's not like only made up of typical kids, it's made up of kids with autism, kids with ADHD, et cetera. So it's not sort of uniformly the case that having an autism diagnosis puts you in a impaired executive function class. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity there as I you know, so, sort of uh, alluded to. Um, and uh, another undergrad in the lab, Adriana, um, replicated this finding of three different executive function classes um, in, our, in our own sample of kids with autism and typical developing kid. Again, what's, a what's interesting is the average group. The average group, um, you know, 30% of it is comprised of kids on the, on the spectrum. So it's not just the case that it, having autism means you have impaired executive function. Uh, it's not guaranteed. So what is the difference between you know, kids who are doing well and, and kids who are more impaired? Our initial hypothesis was that it may be something related to the ability of the brain to switch between different states. Are there just fewer transitions between states in autism? Um, and this is some work by Desanomi again, taking advantage of the uh, uh, publicly available autism brain imaging data exchange. So resting state fMRI here from a, a sample of adults um, showed that using again the um, same way of computing transitions between brain states, there's some evidence that um, uh, indeed the individuals with autism show fewer brain state transitions consistent with what we thought. Um, so another undergrad in the lab, Emily Marshall, was uh, working on the insula in particular, the, sal the cingulate and insular um, salience network. And she found um, evidence for a pattern in which that network was sort of overconnected or co-activated with, with the other uh, two networks I mentioned. Um, and that co-activation pattern was um, showing up less frequently in the kids with autism compared to the typically developing uh, kids that we looked at here. So there's some differences, you know, both at the whole brain level and at the specific network level. Um, so a couple of students uh, in the lab, um, Bryce Dirks here did a study Again, not just looking at task related, not just looking at rest related responses, but task as well. And this is a really simple attention task where part of the time um, uh, the kids are just asked to pick what's different. And sometimes they're, an object is different based on its color and sometimes its shape. And sometimes you get blocks in which there's mixed color and shape. Turns out to be too easy of a task. Um, but if you look at the dynamics of these three different networks across task performance, kids with autism do this really well. It's by the end of the fourth run, when they've done it for the fourth time, that they start to really differ uh, in their performance um, and or start to differ in their brain dynamics, uh, rather. And it's by that time that they actually need more recruitment of the lateral frontal parietal networks in order to achieve the same level of behavioral performance as their, um, as their typically developing peers. So um, altogether, um, dynamic functional connectivity approaches reveal how atypical patterns of brain dynamics 
in these prevalent neurodevelopmental disorders um, characterized by cognitive inflexibility, uh, how they play out. And so how, uh, you know, what I've been sort of hinting at all along is that we, we think that these individual differences in brain dynamics underlie individual differences in flexible behaviors, especially, you know, in, in um, the disorders where flexible cognition is impaired. Uh, but again, there's so many different ways in which the brain implements flexibility. Depending on where you look, you're going to find some signature of flexibility that can be at the whole brain level, as I've shown you, can be um, in the relationship between different networks, uh, it changes over the lifespan, as I've shown you. Um, so it's not going to be a simple thing to find out how the brain does flexibility because it's it's you know it's difficult enough if you just use one task in different populations. But as you can see, there's underlying intrinsic properties of the brain that predispose it to being more or less amenable to to uh, to flexible cognition and behavior. Um, so all of this is sort of gearing up to um, think more about how we can tailor um, interventions and find the individuals who are most likely to benefit from them to reach the optimal levels of, of flexibility for uh, thriving in life. And uh, this is the, the group um, who, that does all the work that, I, that I've been mentioning today in my collaboration network on the right, which I'm, I'm happy to, to have continue to grow. Um, these are sort of the funding sources, the people who've contributed data and code and labor over the years and ideas. Um, probably left some folks off of here as well, but uh, it's always a, a pleasure to do this work collaboratively. Um, and I was asked to just speak for a couple minutes about the, the final topic of today's um, uh, seminar basically will be, uh, I know, a discussion on inclusivity and diversity within, within the, um, you know, the community. And there's a special topic that I'm editing with um, colleagues, Stephanie Bodison is spearheading this on um, justice, equity, and diversity and inclusion in the neuroscience is now open for submission. So please do feel free to get in touch if you have anything um, on the topic that you think would be relevant. Um, as Pierre mentioned, this is sort of a topic that's really uh, close to my heart. And I think that there's a lot we can do as mentors and allies to promote diversity and inclusivity in, the, you know, in, in all of our organizations and our institutions. Um, I work a lot with the Organization for Human Brain Mapping student postdoc group that does a great job of writing articles about um, career self uh, self management of careers and um, i'm the incoming chair of the ohbm uh, diversity and inclusivity committee and we've been doing a lot of work over the years to sort of um, provide educational resources and um, i'm more recently now involved with the flux developmental cognitive neuroscience society um, diversity affinity groups as well so there's a lot you can do. You can sign up to be a mentor. That's simple enough. You can have, you know, online meetings. Um, there's some, you know, if you work on admissions committees, which I do, for example, for a neuroscience graduate program, um, you can think about ways to reevaluate your metrics um, in order to, um, you know, be more inclusive and dismantle systems of privilege. And basically, you know, the things we can do the most are at the mentoring end of things. Um, you can just say, hey, I'm available to be a mentor to someone outside of my institution. Um, on my Twitter account, it says I'm open to mentoring. You can email me for, you know, from wherever you are in the world. And we've seen how because of COVID, we've had to do everything virtual anyway. So that means we can open up our borders and our um, calendars a little bit more freely to, uh, to really just say, hey, I'm, I'm here for career mentoring if you if you want to be that that person. Um, something I've been working on with uh, OHBM in a different arena is, is best practices for, um, I'm working right now on best practices for brain network um, nomenclature, and that's a, an ongoing project. But uh, there's been best practices for a long time, you know, how to report MRI data, how to report MEEG data. Um, this is something that we as societies really like is best practices. So I think that what we need to do is, you know, develop best practices for embracing diversity and inclusivity in academic societies. And one way I'm doing this, um, working towards doing this, is with a sort of pan-society effort that's now um, including all different neuroscience organizations. Um, in the United States, NIH has taken an interest in this and is starting to um, do listening sessions with different you know, basically we're all reinventing the wheel by having different diversity committees for each different group that we're part of. And so my entire calendar is filled up with diversity committee meetings. Um, but what we really need, I think, are, um, you know, these best practices that can be used across different societies that we can uh, agree on in terms of, um, you know, how to improve uh, inclusivity uh, throughout 
And so um, that's it for, for today. I wanted to leave some time for questions if there are any. And um, I'm really, again, happy to be um, uh, one of the, the keynotes in this illustrious group. And I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Lucina. W once again, I mean, it's a, it's a lonely clap, but many people <laughs> are joining me in, in spirit, right? And uh, there's lots of questions. There's been lots of discussion in the chat. Oh, great. And uh, so we're going to go through them. I'm going to try to group them so we can cover as many as, as possible. Sure. But right before we start, and very quickly, because, you know, you've, you've opened and closed on the same ideas that, you know, you're, you're not necessarily doing AI. We are very happy you're giving one of our keynote. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> absolutely fantastic and we have a long tradition the core of the speakers are new ai people but we have more pure ai people or pure new people if we think they can really contribute to the debate there's lots of interest in moving past the visual system in, in modeling <laughs> and we've seen lots of examples of that lots of interest in things like working memory control the global workspace theory and also consciousness you know default mode network whatever it does may have something to do with consciousness. That's one of our questions. So I think hearing from the expert about what we know about the new anatomy of those systems that you know subserves those functions is definitely very relevant for, for this conference. So thanks again for accepting the invitation and the wonderful talk. So to the question. The first one in the vote is what is the mechanism that would make people with autism less flexible and could there be flip side advantages to it? And a, a, a coupled question is by Marie Saint Laurent. Um, doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop. Uh, ah, God, the, 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 the interface changes the order of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to be flexible, Pierre. <laughs> and then I'm not, but uh, trying. Is the flip coin of flexibility distractability? And are there cognitive patterns that reflect the capacity for sustained focused attention? So, you know, people on autism are able of hyper focus, which is actually awesome, uh, and not less so to flip between tasks. So, yeah, yeah, this is, these are great questions. I mean, I was always sort of talking about it as if it's good to be flexible, but there's the flip side of, you know, of everything, which is too much flexibility and distractibility, for example, if in ADHD, if your attention is everywhere, um, you know, that's sort of the other side of, of flexibility. So I think there's going to be a, you know, an optimal level for, for any situation. And, um, and in fact, uh, some of the, the brain signal variability work, which I, I didn't get to talk about at all today, but some of that work suggests that, um, you know, a certain level of brain variability is, is optimal for flexibility, but another level is, is optimal for stability or, or, you know, concentration or, you know, sustained attention, for example. So it's not just like more flexibility is better, but there may be conditions in which it's optimal to be flexible, like in a flexible item selection task, for example, but other conditions in which the sustained attention will do better for you. I mean, in autism, in fact, I'm now um, working with a group that's thinking about exceptional abilities in autism. So the sort of high, uh, the flip end of, uh, you know, most people talk about deficits, but you often see things like mathematical ability or musical ability, just really exceptional, almost savant-like skills in some fraction of individuals with autism. And some one of the theories there, one of the cognitive theories is in fact that this hyper-focus and um, lack of flexibility, in fact, it contributes to these exceptional abilities in some cases. So um, exactly the case, uh, whoever is asking that question, that um, there can be some benefits there as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, there's some some uh, reaction in the chat, but that's <laughs> just way too much task. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to move on <laughs> with the next question. So um, question for Marie Saint Laurent. How do you expect your five different states observed during the tasks to map on two different stages of sleep. And a follow-up question by Abilash Dwarakanath, and sorry if I've um, mispronounced your name, uh, or even, different, if, even dif during different types of anesthetics. So could that reflect the degree of consciousness? Yeah, the, the states, um, Vince Calhoun's group has done a lot of good work on this uh, using EEG fMRI. And in fact, the states that I showed that are more related to better cognitive flexibility are the ones that are also related to higher arousal and vigilance. So there is um, uh, some a lot of nice work there, not from my lab, of course, but from other folks have really looked at this question. So there are some brain states that are you see more in the you know high arousal, high vigilance 
and and that of course would contribute to better performance and better uh, you know on on a range of tasks. So that that work is out there for sure. I would say check out one of Vince Calhoun's 800 papers. Uh, absolutely, it's been known for people to sleep during fMRI even <laughs> yeah. during the task. So it's, right. it's not, it may actually literally relate to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's a it's a great question. It's it's definitely related to arousal levels. All right. So another very recurring question we've had is uh, to what degree your results map with the structural organization? So I'm going to go to, into a couple of specifics. Mm -hmm. So do those insula functional cluster maps uh, onto their structural connectivity, white matter projection? There was another one when you had, you know, the, van, the, the, the midline frontopietal and the lateral frontopietal, which, you know, in, in old parlance, default yeah. model. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> right. I know you, you're trying to reform. I'm trying, terms, but OK. <laughs> so would the correspondence between the posterior and anterior nodes be driven by major white matter pathways? Is there good evidence for that? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we try to do a lot of sort of structure function mapping with varying degrees of success, and I think um, the, the failures tell you more about the methods than they do about actual brain stuff, if you want my opinion on it. But, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's like some, um, you know, evidence that there's, there's parallels in structural connectivity that, you know, are, are relating to the, the functional connectivity. But I mean, the beauty of functional connectivity is you don't need structural connections in order for it to exist, right? So we see functional connectivity between right and left hemisphere homologs in a split brain patient where there's no direct structural pathways at all, but we still see that there's some functional connectivity, which is just correlation, right? So we do see how signals can correlate. Maybe it's through a subcortical pathway, maybe it's somewhere else. Um, but uh, but there's, uh, so yes, in, yes, sometimes there's a good correlation between the two, but other times, not always. <laughs> I mean, I may overinterpret the people who ask their questions, <laughs> but I know that in, in AI, there's been inspirations drawn from the way the brain is connected in, in visual vision modeling. So mm -hmm. the, the convolutional uh, mm -hmm. layers mm -hmm. were directly inspired by, ah. by the brain and proved very successful to do vision tasks. And I guess at this ah. stage, maybe people are after a, the secret source of, of brain <laughs> connectivity to have flexible task switching and, and generalizability. But um, yeah. You no, know, it's neuroanatomy a, it's, is hard. Yeah, well, and neuroanatomy is hard, and I think that vision is is um, has seen a lot more success than you'll see with in terms of AI than you'll see in these other systems because there's so many ways to be what we call flexible. There's so many ways the brain can do it. Um, there's so many individual differences that you know you could just pick one and instantiate that, and that would work. But is that, you know, <laughs> I think it's going to be a harder AI problem than than a lot of these these other domains. So, thanks a lot. <laughs> I, I'm going to move to the next category of questions. Oh, sure. uh, uh, the that one is by Max Puelmatuzel, and um, I'm going to try to summarize it a little bit, but. It, so what he says is that some flexible behavior can be. Um, seen just by looking at a single uh, brain region. So for example, the exploration in visual task can be explained, I would guess, you know, decoded just by looking at the activity of frontal eye fields mm -hmm. alone, without looking at the network uh, activity. Mm -hmm. So uh, his question is like, to get a readout using techniques such as fMRI, mm -hmm. would we need to use tasks that we know need to combine computation from multiple areas? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I guess that uh, in, and in the particular task that you use, do you yeah. really see this recruitment of massive networks or more like single regions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we always see recruitment of massive networks. That's a point I was trying to, to get across. It's like in the tasks I used, we, we saw like that the IFJ, if you sort of, that's sort of the main driver for that task. Um, but the other regions are clearly active. They're sort of maybe it's six, you know secondary to the IFJ according to what we saw, but they're all active across the, the all the frontal parietal regions, you know, all these network nodes. So um, and so even if you could like decode all of the things from one of the nodes, it doesn't mean that the others are not also mm -hmm. contributing in some way. Um, so, uh, and perhaps that's what contributes to a lot of the redundancy and ability to compensate for brain injury that, that you often see is like, okay, well, you did damage 
that one node, but the person can still do the task because there's still some ability of, of other systems to, to come in and come online. I think that's what makes the brain so different from most um, you know, hardwares is that it, there's a lot of redundancy and there's a lot of different ways to get at the same problem. Um, the brain is sort of flexible in that way, I guess. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. But I think it's also one of the beauty of the main communities that there are people from very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. It's true that when you look at a single region, it's very rich and you can kind of like get lost in it. But in fMRI, you always see those big networks, basically. Yeah. Actually, I mean, that network you were talking about was called the task positive network. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's because like, it's just positive for tasks. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah. general. Yeah, well, the, right. the problem actually, Pierre, I was saying we need to come up with network names that are more consistent because if I call it task positive and you call it executive control, we can never get to some conclusion. So that's sort of no. my goal right now. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got like, maybe let's one last last question, and we're going to have to to shift. Does brain flexibility decrease with age? Uh, yes, as far as we can tell, unfortunately. <laughs> But, you know, there are, the brain can still do these tasks. It's just doing them differently <laughs> or trying to do them differently. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Lucina. <laughs> Again, I, I know you have to go, unfortunately, so we won't be able to take the other question, but all this is recorded and you can and look you at can, the chat. And you can email me. I think I, I made my email very easy for everybody. So. Um. <laughs> all right. Thanks for, for sharing that in the chat. Wonderful. So we are now going to switch to our next panel. And please join me again to thank uh, Dr. Udin for the wonderful uh, keynote lecture. Thanks, Pierre.